Greetings. In this video, we're going to talk about masonry construction and its structural properties. We'll talk about different masonry units, mortar and grout that accompany it, along with reinforcement, how it comes together as a system, specifically look at bond beams and what they do, and then the different types of stresses and failure modes that masonry experiences. Uh, until the late 19th century, nearly all buildings, their exterior walls were load-bearing masonry construction. And that's what we see happening here, this kind of interlocking of the different masonry units. And here in Philadelphia, oh, there's a lot of fantastic old historic buildings that have very, very big, heavy-duty masonry load-bearing walls. Um, some of the downsides of that is that they were poor thermal insulators, not a high R value. They were very heavy. So therefore they require large foundations and they are limited to a few stories. So that is some of the negatives. Here we have a look at a traditional masonry wall from the inside. We can see the, the floor joists above resting on a shelf or a ledge that was created here. Um, then we see the nice uh, shallow arches used to span the windows. There are a couple of different types of masonry walls or variations. I should say there are two main types, but um, numerous variations on them. So a composite masonry wall is what we're looking at here. So multi-width, so the outer width is stone, face brick, or other durable masonry material. So the width refers to, this would be the outside width, these bricks, and then the inside width would be the um, CMU, um, concrete masonry units, or sometimes called cinder blocks, larger pieces like that, but um, we'll call them CMU. The inner width, so these are the ones that don't show, are less expensive clay units. They don't require the same level of durability or um, finish appearance. So the, the outer width is really there to withstand the weather and to protect the in, inner width, typically. Importantly, this one that we're looking at has no internal cavity here. The spaces between the widths are filled with mortar. So that's that right there, the space between the widths. Um, widths are bonded with head units in traditional construction or metal ties. So we could see a little, little sliver of a line right there. So that's a metal tie holding them together. And then if we just jump back real quick here, um, so what do we call them? We call them header units right there, the header unit. So we can see those here, headers, and that's that piece. So typically the masonry runs, when we're looking at masonry, we usually think of bricks running in this fashion, but then if we, when you look around, especially again, old, old city Philadelphia, for, for example, where I am, um, we'll see a lot of beautiful brick bond patterns. And these, where we see the short bricks, those have been turned, and that's the header right there, and those are kind of lacing together and locking the different widths in. So it's not just about appearance, those brick bonds that we see. It's actually, again, going back to how I described it kind of as a puzzle, um, and they're interlocking and holding things together. Um, yes, yeah, so this is most commonly um, associated with traditional or historic masonry wall construction. And then the uh, masonry got um, updated and a lot of the issues that we have had with it in the past were um, addressed. So brought up to date and made more resistant to the passage of water, air, and heat. Okay, water, air, and heat, keeping all those things outside, basically, keeping the heat inside and the water and the air outside. Um, so higher strength masonry and concrete, so better products, new insulating materials were incorporated, cavities, so we could see a cavity, let's see right here, so airspace, they're calling it right there, so that's a cavity. So if any water gets behind this brick, it finds the cavity and heads down rather than in, and flashing, ever, ever so important. And let's see if we could find any flashing here down at the bottom. They're not calling it out, but right there, that dark line, see some flashing right there. Okay, and then just to go over this quickly, so here we see the outside brick right there, then we have an air cavity, then we see the rigid insulation, and then here we see the CMU units. That's a bond beam right there, so those two little black dots are the reinforcement. So we often, and we'll talk more about bond beams, but you often find them at the top of walls to kind of lock them in together. So again, here on the first floor, a bond beam 
floor, and then we're in the second floor, bond beam. Okay, and that's most of what we see there. Here's a nice image of it. The, um, the in in International Masonry Institute has a lot of nice images. If you are in need of others to look at and to learn from, it's a great resource. So here we see the bricks. Then there should be an airspace. Yes, an air probably an airspace behind it here. And then we got these kind of um, netting or kind of like a, like a very heavy-duty sponge water dropping collection device. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Down here we have some... Um, some flashing right there, kind of locking in this um, this piece here, flexible flashing. So this is like a kind of a heavy-duty plastic flexible flashing, and that, that's kind of sealing it there, termination bar. Um, so brick, space, insulation, a um, air moisture vapor barrier in front of the CMU, and then here we're to the load-bearing wall, actually. And we can see reinforcement there as well. So there's vertical rebar, grouted and some horizontal um, reinforcement as well and so yes you should we should be able to differentiate between load bearing and non-load bearing components so here the inner width the cmu units are doing the heavy lifting and the brick is there to protect the assembly And here we see the vertical reinforcement, and then it has ties right there. So the same the same kind of ladder, you might call it, running along the horizontal in, inner width. Then it, it reaches out, and they have to place the insulation around it, and, and it reaches out and grabs onto the brick. And um, not coincidentally, the height of three bricks equals the height of one CMU unit. So this is all... Um, easy to plan and install. So here we have masonry load bearing walls. Um, so carry gravity loads from one part of the structure to the other, from the roof all the way down. So new, new masonry construction, yes, has greater strength. And also very important, improved resistance to seismic forces, so earthquake events, very important. In general, masonry is not the greatest structural system for dealing with seismic events, but it has been improved. Um, again, could be composite or cavity, and we just looked at those two options. Here are some more images of reinforcement. So there is our horizontal. We see uh, vertical dowels coming through. Here's a bond beam being created at the, at the uh, base of this wall. We can see um, rebar kind of tailing out there, probably something coming to join it. Again, maybe a kind of a embedded, appears to be like, you might almost call it a column there, embedded within the wall. A lot of, a lot of masonry, kind of almost like suspiciously close to each other, which is a little peculiar there. Typically, there should be a little space between them. And then here's kind of a nice cross section. So I suspect we're on the outside of the wall here. Again, the outer width tying in through the insulation to the inner width. And this is all in contrast to, well, not completely in contrast. Here's, here's our, this is really a single width. This is, this is basically just kind of um, functioning as wallpaper, right? And there's, there's a lot of it out there today. Um, it's just cheaper and easy. It's cheap and easy to put up, very economical. So, but important to recognize that it is not doing anything, not doing anything structurally. But here's the inner or the single width, and we can see the vertical dowels there. So CMU comes in a great variety of shapes and sizes for all occasions. Some here we have kind of a chiseled rough face. So some sometimes they are there are um, blocks units for um, that have a, a finished side for being uh, showing and being presented. Others are just intended to be buried within the wall and not not show. All right, criteria for the classification of CMU. All right, so there are so we we describe them according to weight expressed in pounds per cubic foot. So we have normal, medium, and light weight. Normal weight coming in at 125 pounds a cubic foot or over. Medium. 125 down to 105, so structural types and sizes are stocked most extensively in medium weight. All right, so that is most common. And then lightweight is 
um, 105 or less. So normal weight is the least expensive. So you pay more to purchase a, um, a lighter block. Lightweight is the most expensive. Medium weight is the most popular, has the greatest availability for structural applications. It's moderate weight and cost generally offer the best labor production to material ratio. Um, so it's it doesn't cost as much as the lightweight, but it's reasonable for being installed in, in a timely, um, you know, fashion on the job site. So you have to you have to weigh builders, of course, and designers have to weigh the um, the cost of the material versus the ability to put it in and again in a quickly, quick, relatively speaking, quickly. OK. So that is strength. So the compressive strength of concrete used to, so we describe the strength as the compressive strength of concrete used to manufacture the unit, right? So it starts as, you know, wet concrete, of course, and whatever that concrete is, then that is the weight of the unit. And it's always described as compressive strength, um, comparable to the strength of normal or precast concrete, which is about 3000 PSI or greater. We describe the shape of it, so we have solid or hollow, and the permeability of it. So grade N could be exposed to water in a below grade um, application, and grade S is to, is to be used when protected from moisture. Okay, so very important um, concerns that need to be addressed there. All right, on to mortar and grout, very, very important. Um, so both products are Portland cement products. Okay, so that's um, their, their, their kind of um, similarity there. And this causes them to harden. The variable is the amount of water that is added to them. Okay, so mortar used to provide a level bedding surface for masonry products and provide water resistance at their joints. So let's just jump forward real quick. And so the mortar is here in between the bricks. So they're right there is a vertical mortar joint and there's a horizontal mortar joint. OK, um, so yes. So the bedding surface means that each course and here. So we have that's a single course there and then another course on top of it and another course on top of it. So those are the horizontal runs or the courses. Um, so the mortar provides a level surface so that each each course of masonry could be easily leveled and doesn't rely specifically on the course below it and to, to resist water coming in at those joints. OK, so it's got the Portland cement, sand, lime and water, and there are different types for different applications, exterior, interior load bearing and not load bearing. So very important decisions there. Grout, similar, except it's used as filler. So it's not used for the bedding, the bed joints, um, especially in vertically reinforced wall. And that's what that next slide is that we'll be moving to. So it's specified either, either as a fine grain or a coarse grain. It's a filler product. It's intended to flow. Therefore, it has more water in it. OK, a mason will fill the cores of a CMU with grout. And that's what we see occurring here. So this is just a demonstration where they stripped away um, the face of the masonry units and covered it with plexiglass. So very nice to get an interior visual on what's happening, which we rarely, rarely do. Um, so self-consolidating grout, that's what they're, in, they're placing there, as seen through the clear plastic face in this demonstration panel. So here is the hose and the grout is coming down. We see it there. And then it's moving over here. So obviously the goal is to fill the cavity completely and not have any voids. New grout formulations incorporating newer class of chemical admixtures um, help it become a very fluid but stable mix. Okay, so those are the two things that we're looking for. Fluid so that it fills all the voids and stable. And we will be getting onto concrete in another lecture um, and we'll be talking about slump tests. So for now, let's just say that this cone here is 12 inches tall, and if it's filled with concrete, it's a metal, metal metal cone, and then we fill it and kind of top it off there and then pick up the cone, and what happens is the mix slumps. And for concrete, we would expect a slump of 1 to 6 inches. For mortar, it would slump 5 to 8 inches, and grout would borderline be a puddle, 
slumping all the way down to as much as 11 inches, 8 to 11 inches. So that is that speaks of the water content of the material. Okay, so grout we need to fill spaces, so it needs to be fluid. Mortar is the bedding joint, so it is not concrete that gets that we use. Concrete is not mixed with masonry for the installation of the masonry. Okay. And here's a um, pretty detailed um, visual on a wall. So it, we're discussing in this slide, however, the, the grout pour and the grout lift. So the grout pour, the total height of masonry to be grouted prior to the construction of additional masonry. So we build a wall, we stop, and then we grout. And that is the grout pour. Okay. So the height or drop height. A grout pour can consist of one or more lifts. Grout lift, the vertical height of the grout placed at one time. Okay, the vertical height of the grout placed at one time. So the engineer would specify how much, how, how far we could pour or drop the, um, drop the grout. There's a limit to the distance. We can't build very, very tall walls and, and drop it from whatever height we, we prefer. Okay. So here we see our CM units, and we have our mortar joints right there. We have our vertical reinforcement. So we have a, um, so there are two options here. Option one, this is building the bond beams. So it's kind of this trough, and this is a specialty item designed to become a bond beam. So it's, again, that trough piece, and maybe laid across the horizontal reinforcement would be placed and then it would be poured full of grout. Option two, in contrast, is down here. This is just your standard CMU with the cross webs knocked out. So um, the cross web is the piece, the interior piece, and then they just hit that out with a hammer. So it's kind of done on the job site. The engineer would um, specify if that's allowed or not. Um, here we have some metal lath down at the bottom to catch the grout and to secure it and then anything that falls down to the bottom we have these clean outs to clean it out and also to be able to inspect the dowels before the wall is closed up. Here's some horizontal reinforcement as well. Mm -hmm. And a rebar positioner or a wall tie there to keep the vertical dowels standing upright. Okay, here is the grout being placed. So characteristics of mortar, very important. So when mortar is wet and plastic and during installation, as we see it here, it should be um, very workable. So this is important for a good bond that it joins the masonry. It should retain its water and the rate of hardening is very important, how quickly it hardens. And that could, um, that could be affected or, or it could be influenced by, again, the add mixtures, different things that are added to it. And in extreme climates, in heat or cold, um, the engineer would specify or just, just how quickly it has to be hardened. So that's why they would specify additional add mixtures so that it's not um, going, staying, pl remaining plastic and wet for too long. Okay, so um, it should harden in a reasonable time so that further courses of masonry can be, la be laid without excessive racking movements below so that the masons could continue the work and not be crushing the mortar below. So we want it to harden quick enough. Um, it should have sufficient workability so that it's easy to fill the joints and it should retain water, which should not be escaping into the masonry units. All right, so that's all when it is plastic and wet and being installed. When it's hardened, the bond is most important. Okay, so how well it sticks to the unit. Okay, how well it bonds to the unit. Not that it bonds one unit to another. Okay, so very important. The mortar is not like glue. All right, it is not really a structural um, it's not really a structural player. It, it has to have enough compressive strength so that it doesn't get crushed under the weight of the wall, but it is not holding one unit to another. It has no tensile strength. 
So it's very high in compressive strength, so it will not get crushed, but it is not glue that is keeping one unit stuck to another. That's very important to understand. And it should have some stability and durability, of course, so that it is not changing its shape or volume. Okay, so looking at some details for mortar. Okay, so the stronger the mortar, the less flexible it is, and the more likely it is to crack under freezing and thawing cycles. All right, so the stronger the mortar, the less flexible it is. Stronger than necessary mortars, therefore, should not be over-specified. Okay, so here we see the compressive strength of the masonry units. And again, there are different types of mortar for different locations. And there is a clear chart that the engineer would specify. So if we're working with 10,000 PSI CMU units, then these are the mortar strengths that we should be working for with. So it is not a good thing to specify a stronger mortar. So stronger is not necessarily better. We have to find the appropriate, um, the appropriate strength mortar for the specified block. Okay. Mortar should be sufficiently plastic and the unit should be placed with sufficient pressure to extrude mortar from the joint and produce a tight joint. So that is what we see happening here. So this is why, going back to that earlier slide, that we have those mortar nets at the bottom, those heavy duty sponges that are going to keep all this excess of mortar while it's being installed. It's, 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 a pro, it's needed that there's some excess of mortar. Um, and some of it is inevitably going to fall down into the, um, the void or the, 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 yes, the void, the, um, yeah, we'll call it the, the void in the wall between the two widths. And what we don't want to happen is for that mortar to reach the very bottom and clog up weep holes. We want water to make its way down and find the weep holes so that it could escape in the proper direction, which is out and not in, of course. So the masons need to get rid of as much of this excess mortar as possible. It shouldn't end up at the bottom of the wall, but inevitably some does. Okay. All right. And here's a look at some cross sections of the um, different mortar joints. All right. So the execution of joints is very important to achieve the proper strength. Dr joints could either be troweled or they could be tooled. This is a tool, and that's how they're they're completing that concave shape. Trowel, they they call it striking or mortar being struck off with a trowel, and that's probably what's happening here. The mason's using this trowel to clean this off as he or she goes. And different types of joints, many different types. Um, to simplify and just talk about what we're looking for or what we prefer. So trowel joints do not compress the mortar the way tool joints do. Consequently, they tend to be less water resistant. So using that tool pushes it in nicely. And so that's what we see there. And it compresses it and makes it more water resistant. So this method is um, not as strong in that regard. It's not as waterproof. Okay. Moving on to bond beams and columns. So, bond beam, a course of trough-shaped units laid in a wall. And that's what we see happening right there, the trough, like a horse drinks out of a trough. Um, reinforcement bars are placed in the void with shear transfer rods connecting the beam to the masonry courses below. Okay, so we get a vertical pieces connecting the... Um, the horizontal reinforcement and those would be shear transfer rods um, a trough unit are then con concreted or filled concreted that's not really the best word for that it's really filled it's filled with um grout um, i in my professional experience have never come across columns but it makes sense so we have these um, kind of horseshoe shaped pieces then we have the vertical reinforcement and then it's filled with grout so it works kind of um, same same principle. I've just have not seen these. I've not come across them myself. All right, bond beams. So here's a wall and cross section, and we see two bond beams right there. Okay, so used in masonry load bearing walls, um, serve as horizontal members, typically along the top of walls, tying the walls together. 
Okay, so this is really just a series where not here we are in the field, not not at the top or the bottom or, or at the bond beam, just in the middle here. Um, there's really no continuity between these. So in terms of movement in um, this direction in particular, there's not much to resist it. That's why we bring in the bond beams. Okay, um, sometimes used below a line of bar joists, and we'll see that in the next picture, and as lintels, we'll see that in the next image as well. All right, but here is helping helping provide lateral um, resistance, resistance to kind of lateral um, forces. And then we see it right there in cross section. And here, so now we see what's going, occurring here. So used below a line of bar joists so that the joists can be anchored into them. And that's what we see occurring right here, actually, not at the top. This is the very top of the wall. That's the parapet. So here's our roof. And then there's a parapet, a short wall. It kind of um, hides the roof there. And we don't have water from the roof just spilling off the end of our building. So that's why we have parapets. Um, but here's a bond beam at, at the location of the roof joists. And they could be embedded into the bond beam. That's what it says there. And they're also used um, over windows and doors as lintels. And here's a bond beam. So serves to impart horizontal strength to a wall where it may not otherwise be braced to a floor or roof structure. So we like these walls need to be braced to something. And if there's nothing nearby, if it's a particularly tall wall, then we uh, will see those intermediate bond beams providing that horizontal strength. And then here is the, um, so this is what I, I had mentioned in an earlier slide. So there's our standard CMU, and then the mason will just knock out those interior webs, and that's what's left. And here are the specialty pieces and notched there to allow the vertical reinforcement coming through. Um, most commonly used concrete masonry units, special shapes allow them to blend with the wall. So that's basically what that says. And this is a pretty good diagram. Um, so here we see the horizontal bond beam across the top. The dash lines are the vertical reinforcement. We see a hook coming in right there that is connecting the horizontal bond beam to the vertical column. Um, engineers will specify just exactly where the reinforcement should be. So the cover is meaning that we don't want our reinforcement up at the very top where it could um, water could find it and rust it and make it have it deteriorate. So the engineers will specify the cover. That's the literally the amount of concrete that or grout that needs to cover the reinforcement. And then we see the vertical reinforcement dash lines running down there. Engineers will specify how much of a lap we need from the footing, the concrete footing. Those vertical dowels will be placed. So the engineer will specify that there needs to be a 25 inch minimum lap or whatever the number is for the particular assembly. That's our footing reinforced again, minimum cover at the bottom so that our horizontal rebar in the footing is not sitting on the ground and the moisture from the earth is finding it and deteriorating it and a clean out down at the bottom. Okay. All right, moving on to some masonry stresses and um, failure, failure modes. So in general, masonry is a four-way composite action. So this is a term that shows up in structural engineering in, for different types of assemblies. And it's basically when a number of different um, elements work together. So we have the CMU units, the mortar, the reinforcement, and the grout all working together in composite action. They have very high compressive strength, but they are also brittle and they're low ductility. And this is what makes them not ideal for earthquake prone regions. And unfortunately, some parts of the world that are earthquake prone are also um, do not have a lot of wood and forests. So masonry is common in some earthquake prone areas, unfortunately, because it is not the safest or ideal assembly for those areas. Tension is good when the reinforcement is included to um, take on the tension. So that would be the horizontal reinforcement in bond beams, for instance. Um, very little tensile strength without the reinforcement, and they are 
Um, continuous joints are a plane of weakness, and we'll see some of these failure modes now. So a badly damaged earthquake, um, earthquake damaged structure here. And what this diagram is showing that we have cracking in the building with no corner reinforcement. So corners, um, corners are a very, a, a very susceptible to cracking, prone to cracking. And that's what we see occurring here. All these are stemming from corners, corners of windows and doors, as well as corners of buildings. Here we see the reinforcement holding it together. So a lintel band across the top. We have the vertical reinforcement bands and a sill band as well. And it helps resist the cracking at the openings. Some very significant cracking here. So this um, something obviously earthquake damaged um, separated these two walls. So complete lack of reinforcement we could see right through there. So there's no horizontal reinforcement significant cracking in all directions coming directly from the window. So what happens? How does how does this group of masonry units react when pushed for um, earthquake? Again, is one big reason we see um, clear, strong results. Um, the, the results are very clear then. But um, even not in earthquake prone areas, we have um, settlement of the earth will cause a lot of masonry failures if um, water from a building is not being diverted far enough away and brought allowed to fall directly down at the foundation over time it could um, allow the foundation to settle and we see masonry failures because of that so we have the mortar bed and we could have it sliding so like a shearing action there that's a place where failure may occur um, so the whole wall could lean and we could have compressive failure of units at the very bottom and we could have cracking diagonal cracking right through the units actually this is the plane of the mortar and here we're going right through the units and here um so this is talking about infill frame buildings very complex so that means that we have concrete doing the work the structural work and then we infill the area with non-load bearing masonry but alarmingly sometimes when buildings settle or shift due to again to a seismic event or otherwise just shifting sometimes what was originally designed to not be a load bearing member could take on loads and that's that could be dangerous so here we have the what they call monolithic behavior where the structure and the infill are moving together shifting together here the infill has detached actually i'm just going to back up i, I skipped this slide um so here we have the um probably the concrete is probably doing the work here and here and here um, here's concrete and this is all masonry infill so out of plane failure so where the whole infill just obviously has just come right out and that's three examples of that all of the the infill panels just falling right out and that's what would occur here detachment frame infill so it's no longer connected to the structure here we see some darker gray lines so here we have a shear failure so we, and we see our two arrows. We're always looking for arrows to tell us to describe the um, type of failure. And so all three of these look like they're experiencing shear. Top is being pushed to the right, bottom is being pushed to the left. And here we have some units that have um, detached from each other along, along the mortar. Okay, and that's a shear friction failure. So the masonry units themselves have not been crushed. Um, a diagonal ten tensile failure, so they've been pulled apart again. Again, it looks like it's really just isolated in the mortar joints. And here, again, another example of crushing at the corners or the toes. Zooming in a little bit to individual bricks. So, um, where are we here? So, masonry failures, A, joint displacement right here so we this is experiencing tension right two arrows 
facing away from each other. The bricks have pulled apart because, again, the mortar is not glue. That's not what it's there for. Masonry is not intended to be pulled apart in this fashion, but um, that does happen. B, joint slipping. So here we go. So this is shear, right? We have two arrows pointing in opposite directions, not in line with each other. Tensile failure is in line, shear failure not in line. So the bottom course is being pushed to the right, the top is being pushed to the left, and the mortar in between is where the shear failure occurs. C, unit direct tensile cracking. So here we are, yes, two arrows facing away and right through the unit. They have pulled right apart. Masonry crushing. So masonry is strongest in, in compression. However, it could be crushed. All materials could be. And that's why we see arrows facing each other, getting crushed. And unit diagonal tensile cracking for A. So we have two things going on here. We have compression as well as shear. And then we have some diagonal cracking occurring within the units. And then a couple more final slides, just actual visuals on each of these. So here are those five failure modes. Joint displaced along its length. So that's right there. So the courses have been pulled apart. Joint slips along its length. So that's B right there. Shear forces pulling them apart. Units cracking vertically, C here. So obviously straight down through the units. And again, corners of buildings are very prone to um, settling for different reasons. Footings being washed away. Units being crushed. So I could not find many good examples of that in place, actually. So I had to go into the lab and find a, uh, a hydraulic press that was crushing one. So that was probably probably the least common failure mode because masonry units are strong in compression. And then units cracking diagonally. So whatever's occurred here is just tore right through those bricks. Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that.